Hi guys, and welcome to another edition of The Kevin Moore Show. Now on today's show, I'm about to be joined by my guest, Miguel Dean. Now for the past 20 years, Miguel has worked with disadvantaged youth in the homeless and education sectors. Now his ability to write from the heart developed as he traveled a path of healing and transformation from early life challenges. Now his first book, Stepping Stones, Life Lessons for Overcoming Adversity, was self-published in 2010 and he joins me today to discuss his latest book, Bring Him Home, a twin flame love story. Miguel Dean, welcome to the show. Yeah, you're really welcome. Yeah, yeah. Thank, thank you. It's good to be here. It's great to be here. Hey, it's great to speak to a, another British guy just right now. Because um, <laughs> um, you're based. Uh, what part of the UK are you in? Uh, I'm in Worcestershire. I'm in Malvern, at the foot of the beautiful Malvern Hills, with where all that beautiful spring water comes gushing out of. That's where I am. Okay. 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 Right. Well. Today's an interesting interview. This is a book that came to my attention just last week and we've been able to sort of fit this interview in right now. This was Bring Him Home, A Twin Flame Love Story. Um, what made you write this book? It was one of those things, Kevin, that um, when the idea arrived, it was like I couldn't not write it. Um, I wrote a book, my first book, about seven years ago. And people kept saying, well, you know, when's the next one? Are you going to write some more? And I, and I was like, yeah, I'll know when, when the next book's going to come. It, it just hasn't come yet. So I knew I needed to write it after I split up. My girlfriend and I separated. And it just, it just arose in me. It was like, you need to write this book. You need to share this journey that you have been on and what's happened. Because it was just so powerful and it, yeah, it just seemed to, it was my first-hand experience of how conscious relationships can sort of take you through the fire of love, you know, clean you out and alchemize that twin flame union within yourself, you know, as this title suggests, bring you home. So it was, it just felt, you know, that there were echoes of Fifty Shades of Grey in the background for me and I was always like, oh God, you know is that really where we're at with sexuality and relationships and so on? And so it was like, no, I'm going to, I'm going to do this. I'm going to share this story, warts and all, um, because I, uh, you know, I've, I know the power of vulnerability and I know the power of, of sharing our stories. And so, yeah, I just began, I just sat down and said, well, let's see what happens. Okay. Okay. So, um, Obviously, you've been into the sort of metaphysical, spiritual kind of stuff for a while. Um, looking, you know, at your journey, it seems, it seems to sort of resonate with that. Um, you've been after your own understanding for a while as well. Um, did you know anything about twin flames before you uh, sort of got into this relationship? That's a really good question, Mark. No, and, and the answer is no. I, I, I didn't know. Um uh, sorry, Kevin. <laughs> I didn't know anything about uh, twin flames at all, and I was actually quite skeptical about it. It was, um, I, I guess, I'm. I'd like to say I have a healthy skepticism about a lot of things. Yeah, and twin flames was one of those things until I just found myself on a website one day after we'd separated, reading the eight stages of a twin flame relationship, and just it was just like, okay, I can't avoid this. This these fit exactly and I've never experienced anything like this. Mm. Well, it seems to be, I, I believe that it, there's potential in every relationship that we have, every romantic relationship for want of a better word, to bring us home. To The, the purpose of that relationship is actually to, um, to to catalyze the union of the divine twin flame alchemy of masculine and feminine within each of us. Now, I believe that every, you know, every relationship has that potential or, or can take us a certain way. What seems to be different, perhaps, for a twin flame relationship is that it is, it's like you turn up the volume and the power, like by, you know, a couple of hundred. It's just like a lot more powerful and a lot more intense. And... You know, the, I, st I still have to wait for, the, for this, really, but I believe that that has the potential to take you all the way home. 
rather than just some of the way, as in to realise the truth of who and what we really are beyond what our senses can perceive and this, you know, human experience that we're having. Interesting. Um, now, with your previous relationship, that was, when you look back on it now, um, and obviously being kind to everyone, everyone as well, um, were you very conscious in that relationship? Yeah, yeah. And, and, and it's, it's a bit tricky in, in, in a way, Kevin, because without wanting to give too much away of the ending of the book, whether I'm with my twin flame now or whether I'm not with her, with that point when we were, that we were just talking about, yeah, we separated when, when I started writing the book. And, uh, yeah, and that happened a few times during the course of our relationship. And I actually fondly call those times twin flame sabbaticals that, that, that were needed. Um, was I conscious? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, I've been on the path of, you know, awakening, uh, becoming more conscious, becoming clearer, uh, clearer channel for life for, you know, 20 odd years. But there was it got taken to a whole new level with this relationship. It was like a real sort of paradigm shift, really. Quantum quantum leap in consciousness. Let's go back to your first relationship where you've got your kids and uh, that was a... How, how many years was that relationship? Um, we were together for about 14 years. Uh, married? Uh, yes, yeah, yeah. Married for about 10 of those years. Okay, 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 okay. Um... And when you look back on that relationship compared to the twin flame relationship, what are the major differences in in your behaviour to each other? You know, compared to if, if you were to sort of be like you know, you know, pros and cons yeah. in a sense. But you know, from a spiritual perspective. Wow, that's a really good question. Nobody's ever asked me that one before. Um, it's 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 almost incomparable, really. You know, it was like it was like I was two completely different people. The, the woman was, well, obviously was two completely different people, but like two completely different species. And the whole situation, the whole dance was so different. When I, when I met my wife, the mother of my two sons, I was living on the road. Um, I was a new age traveler. I was taking a lot of drugs. I was um, involved in petty crime and violence and begging on the streets and, you know, was in a really low place. And yeah, we came together in this kind of storm of, violence and drugs and chaos really um and yeah i wasn't i wasn't awake at all then i wasn't awake at all i was totally still numbing and avoiding and unconscious of the fact that my childhood wounds were dictating the behavior and the way that i was living my life so there was no wooing there was no um real reverence for for woman there was no understanding that relationship could, um, you know, bring you home and, and that, that your partner was a wonderful mirror in order to see where it is that you needed to grow. I had no, you know, no awareness of that at all. Um, and, and I began to have an awareness of that, you know, in the latter stages of my marriage. But it was kind of like, it was like the pain and the pull to avoid and distract and try and remedy my pain externally was stronger than my knowledge and my courage and my wisdom to understand that I needed to go inside myself and that it was inside me that the changes needed to take place. Absolutely. Um, was it a difficult decision to, to go through with a divorce? I mean, was that a really di tough time for you to make that decision as well? Yeah. Yeah, it was um it it was the it was a decision that that was and it sometimes happens in my life that I make a decision reasonably lightly uh, or with, with a, an element of kind of naivety, you know, and I don't always think things through or I don't know it's hard because I'm not in you know, I'm not in anybody else's shoes, but what happens for me is I made the decision and thought, well, this will be okay, this needs to happen. My attention is wandering. 
it's better that we separate on good terms before somebody else is involved and all that sort of stuff. I will still live close by. I want this to impact minimally on my sons and I don't believe it has to have a massive impact on them. We can separate amicably. Um, you know, th th that's really what I, what I was, what I believe. And, but what happens has happened a few times in my life is that when I actually made the decision and it actually hit home and, and that I was, and I was doing it, it was the most painful thing that I've ever experienced. I remember, you know, packing up some of my things, waiting until my ex-wife and the kids weren't in and just putting some of my stuff into a suitcase and filling up the car. And, and I was just, yeah, it was a really painful, painful place to be. Well, yeah, because I suppose part of you is thinking, am I doing the right thing? Mm -hmm. You know, uh, I, I, you know, could we not sort this out? No, 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 I'm better off without, you know, I, I, I'm changing, you know, the, 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 there's, that, there's, there's that calling that something else is, you know, it's better to go through this than, than, than to keep it going. And, you know, something is better on the other side for both of you and everything else. You know, these aren't easy, easy decisions. Yeah. Um, not at all. You know, but now, now you did. You, now you've done that. And uh, did you expect then, at any point between when you left to when you met your twin flame, that you was going to meet someone that was going to for you to become a better person in this, in a sense? I don't think it was too high on my agenda. You know, uh, to, to to begin with, it was. It was more, it was almost like I separated the two things. I knew that I had wounds and I knew that there was work I needed to do on myself. And I knew by this stage that my challenges with woman were connected to, a, uh, you know, a deep mother wound that I was carrying that was, that was unhealed. So I knew that, you know, I knew that there, there was a connection. But no, it wasn't a... I think I was still, you know, when I think back, I think I was still in a place of unconsciously coming from the space of I want a woman to complete me, you know, that I will find the right person and we will, you know, live happily ever after and it will be sweet um, because I, I, I became aware quite quickly that, you know, that although there was a Again, it's hard to know because we can't, we don't know what it's like to be somebody else. But I always found it very uncomfortable being single and being on my own. I always felt this incompleteness and this kind of like fear and like something just wasn't right. There was always this kind of like shadowy, uh, yeah, sort of spectre on the, you know, on on the edge of my awareness all the time. And I know that I now know that that was connected to the fact of my mother leaving and and all that sort of stuff. So, um, yeah, I mean, I think I, I, I was beginning to, to become aware that relationship was, you know, was the key. But it, it, I guess that's the thing. It was like I knew it in my head, but it, I hadn't begun to embody it yet and really live it, you know, and really integrate that truth into my being. No, I really appreciate what you're saying. And actually, you know, um, you know when I've been on my own for, you know, however long it's been, I've had to learn, why one thing, one of the things I tried to learn, whether I've learned it or not, I don't know, but one of the things I tried to learn was be happy with your own company, yeah, before you want to get involved with somebody else. And I think I actually did get to that point. And that's why I'm, yeah, I think I did. I think I can say that. But isn't that, imp I mean, but whether that's me healing some point of myself that I didn't know I was healing in that process, I don't know. I mean, do you think we've all got things to heal, you know, from the male and female side of things? Yeah, yeah, I, I, I do think we all have stuff to heal. I think, you know, we we're, we're, were born as pretty, I was going to say, you know, sort of perfect babies, sort of templates, but you know, obviously there's all the past life stuff to take into consideration and what happened when you were inside the womb and all that sort of stuff. But on the whole, yeah, you know, we're pretty pristine when we're born and it seems to me that we're, we're born into a into a dysfunctional society uh, where there are wounds have been passed down from generation to generation um, as I begin to explore you know sacred masculinity and look at the sort of man that I endeavor to be it's I can see that it's an awful long way 
from you know a lot of the you know what the standard you know male um, you know prototype is. Um, so yeah, you know I, I think we all I think we all have have wounds, and that it seems that that's the majority of the work that is being done in the relationship that the woman, my twin flame was mirroring for me my mother wound, you know, as in in, in that she kept leaving me. We would have arguments and stuff, and she would just go, and that would trigger this deep mother wound, this fear of abandonment and being lost. And and I was triggering for her, her father wounds, which were you know, which were I, I was representing in, in in you know in my hate behaviour, in my neediness, and so on. So we all have wounds. We all have wounds. It it seems that 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 you know the the journey from no wounds to having wounds to the healing of the wounds. It's like the journey is the destination. It's like you can't skip it. You can't go from perfect to to to, to realization and oneness. It's it's the road where you have to travel. Well, yeah, I mean, but the, but then you could say that you know you could be healing those issues throughout the whole lifetime. Do you know what I mean? Or even of two people being together. I mean, even till they get to their nineties or the last you know the last breath. I mean, that could still be yeah. being healed. Um, and some wounds are, are bigger than others. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And 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 how much are you pre be prepared to put up with big wounds compared to sort of smaller wounds? Do you know what I mean? <laughs> how much dysfunction does that cause in a relationship as well? Well, yeah, you know, it, it depends how much you want. If you want to go all the way, if you want to come all the way home, uh, then and as I say, you know, I'm a firm believer that the journey is the destination and. Unless I heal, the, as I heal the wounds, it's like there's a clean man having a relationship with my woman increasingly. Whereas, you know, to begin with, there was a wounded man and this terrified little boy. And there was a wounded woman and a terrified little girl. And that's always going to be a recipe for chaos and, and, and pain and dysfunction and, and so on, you know? Well, yeah, but what if in a relationship you're healing quicker than the other and there's a massive gap? I don't believe that that's, well, I guess, I don't believe that that's the norm. I think, you know, there is, I think there probably is the, <clears throat> there are times when, yeah, somebody is healing and somebody is moving and somebody is doing the work and the other refuses to. And there may be a point where you say, okay, well, you're not the right person for me to be. But on the other hand, what invariably happens is that one one person shifts and heals themselves and changes themselves. The dynamic has to change within the <clears throat> within the relationship. It's like a game of tennis, you know. If you're hitting it onto the forehand all the time, they hit back with the forehand. But if you change and hit it onto the backhand, they've got to adapt and you know and hit it back from the backhand. So it, you know, if we remember that. Our external relationships are just a mirror reflection of our internal, what's going on with our internal twin flame thing. So, so what she triggers in you uh, is, is or what, what's projected onto you from the other is what you've not healed in yourself sometimes, even though you'll feel that those issues from the other are, are actually nothing related to what I'm going through. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, it, it requires both parties to take responsibility, uh, you know, and to recognize that when the other is triggering us, it's a gift. They are showing me an area of myself that is not, you know, that is not healed because it's not about what they're doing. It's what it's how I translate what they're doing to mean to me. So, for example, you know, I've been... Um, I've had a few sort of like really sort of strong, um, proactive, assertive women in my life recently. And they've been triggering for me this um, very sort of um, abusive and aggressive and domineering stepmother that I had for, for a long time. So it's not for me to get annoyed or, or whatever with these women that have showed up in my life. They've showed up. It's a gift. It's a blessing because that is still there and when that is healed inside me they won't trigger me and it won't upset me and it won't be an issue at all does that make sense it does it does and you you know 
you can either want to heal it or not. Yeah. You, you, and you can talk the talk that you want to heal it, but you've got to walk the walk. You've got to actually walk the walk. And, and you know, and the prize is, you see, is, is freedom and peace. And, 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 and what, which is what in, increasingly, you know, I'm, I'm experiencing, you know, I'm not triggered left, right and centre anymore. It's like I'm more at peace with myself. And, you know, because it's like when we, the more we let go of fear, because if we, you know, if we come from the understanding that all the negative emotions arise from fear, yeah, the more we remove the fear, the fear is like that which is not in alignment with the truth of who we are. We can't have fear and love filling up the vessel of the heart, if you like. So the more you let go of the fear, which is usually around your childhood wounds and so on, the more the love just rushes in and you become a clearer channel and in alignment with the truth of who you are and you just get filled up and blown away by the beauty and the miracle of this existence because you're seeing it through clearer eyes, not through the filters of pain from the past and so on. Right, understood, absolutely. That makes a lot of sense, that does. Um, well, that's why they say sometimes, don't they? I'm marrying my mum. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You literally are marrying someone that is put, 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 you know, bringing those emotions up for you. Yeah, yeah. It, it's off, you often unconsciously will do that, you know, to to heal those wounds. Uh, and sometimes what happens is that you will choose somebody the opposite. You know, I know. You know, quite often with people that I work with, they've chosen a partner that's exactly the opposite of what they're father or mother was like in an attempt to avoid that but you know it's it's just avoidance and it's just the pendulum swung to the other extreme it's, it, it hasn't actually resolved the root of the issue but yeah yeah we we, we are attracted to uh templates to models to similar things of, of our own parenting yeah I, I can see why others would choose you know the the opposite sometimes um because it's that you know they just want that peace don't they they just they don't want to deal with it and and maybe in this lifetime they don't have to uh, and that's fine they say, you see that there's there's no nothing's that ordained is it in this reality that you have to do anything that you don't want to do i mean yeah we have to there's certain things we have to do do you know what i mean but you know it's not forced upon you no 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 we we have choices absolutely we have choices but it, it, you see it seems to me that i guess a lot of my as my journey evolves, I see more and more that my little story and my little journey is just a microcosm of the collective's story. So while I'm, you know, as, as I am doing the work that I am doing, <clears throat> that energy, if you like, ripples out into the cosmos, into the collective unconscious and, and whatever, and, and it has an impact. So it becomes that it's not just about doing the work for me to bring peace to me. It's it's because that is one of the qualities of the, the sacred masculine is that is an understanding that I am here in service of the collective. So, you know, it, 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 we may have that idea of, oh, let's just go for the easy, the peaceful option. But then when our values are also very much in line with service, that that no longer becomes an option. It's like, you know, it's like you can't unknow what you know. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, that is true as well. Um, yeah, are you being of service by, 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 by avoiding that sometimes as well? Because uh, that, that's also a very you know, deep, but, but that, that's got to be your, that, that, I mean, all this is your truth. This is, this is, your, this is your take on it um, yes. and, and, and it's working for you and that's, that's a beautiful thing. And I think you know, even coming onto shows like this that you have done, uh, you know, is 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 you know reaching the people that it needs to reach right now, and that's the important thing of what you know. Yes, you've written a book, which is fantastic, but that book allows you to to spread that that that, that those words of that, that that book in so many different forms nowadays as well, which is which is great. So, um, if I was to say to you then, twin flame versus soulmate, what's the difference? Yeah. As you just rightly pointed out, this is just my truth, and it, I, the, I guess the honest answer is that I don't really know. My, my 
what I suspect and what my, my kind of gut feeling is that a soulmate is just something that's a lot more. I think a, 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 I think there must be the soulmate thing is just that everything is very compatible, and and you know it's not so fiery and it's a lot smoother and a lot calmer and a lot softer and gentler. Whereas the twin flame is more sort of like a roller coaster ride. Um, I, you know, I, I don't really, yeah, yeah, I, I, I don't know how the, you know, from the perspective of, you know, how conscious relationships, uh, you know, is a path to awakening and ascension and, and, and so on. I don't, I don't really know how that works when it comes to soulmates. My, my sense for me is that, and that what seems to be happening is that myself and my twin flame are increasingly moving into this kind of soulmate territory. It's like we've done the work, the ego, the, you know, and not all, all, you know, the work's never all done, that there's always more to do and there's more layers. It's a, yeah, it's a fatal thing to say, oh, I've done that, it's all done. It's like, whoa, wait, just wait for it, don't say that. But, you know, we've done the majority of the work and things are just steadier and, and then there's more ease and so on and the ego is less... Uh, yeah, less touchy and so on. The ego is more subservient. Well, that's interesting that you talk about that potentially your relationship is moving in from twin flame to soulmate. And and obviously, uh, the twin flame that you refer to in this book and throughout this interview, uh, her name shall not be mentioned and you've kept her, her identity private. She knows that you do this work and you're doing these interviews that we're speaking about her, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, um, and that does that put added pressure on the relationship? Um, that whole journey has been really interesting. Um, it was actually the book, really, that sort of they talk about with, with you know with twin flame and conscious relationship that you know the two becoming the one and and you know and birthing the cosmic child and all this kind of quite new agey sort of language. But it seems in a way that the book was birthed if you like, it was, I like to see it that way, that it was a gift that was brought into the world through our conscious union, through the challenges that, you know, we chose to navigate. Um, so, you know, we were together for about nine months and then we separated. And I, that was when I first started writing the book. And, I'd, and after about three months of writing the book, it, 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 the voice got louder and louder in my head. It was like, I need to get in touch with her and I need to let her know that I'm writing this book. She has to know and it needs her blessing because how can I write a book and put it out into the world, you know, for the in honor and reverence of the divine feminine if she's going not over my dead body? You know, that's not really going to work. So, um, so I got in touch with her and let her know that I was writing the book and she was, she was horrified. She was totally horrified because all, while my way of being is very much about vulnerability and openness and uh, sharing, you know, everything, she was kind of like the opposite extreme, very private, and very shy and very, she, so she was horrified to begin with. I, I eased her concern, um, you know, by saying that it, it was, it was about, portraying what happened from a totally level balanced perspective and there was no oh you know she was a real bitch and what she put me through it was like everything I asked for and, and everything that was painful was a gift because it burnt away the you know that which needed to be burnt away so the you know as the, the we, we were then together for a, a few more months and then we, we split again we, we, we couldn't hold it together and during the time that we got back together, the book was on hold. It was like, all oh, right, you know, how can I, I can't write a book now about, about this, you know, while we're, while this is happening. And then we, then we split up again. So then the book started being written again. And then when I said, and, and when we separated, she said to me, you let me know when you get a publishing deal. I'd like to know when it's going to be out there in the world. So after nine months, I got back in touch with her and said, when I'd got the publishing deal. And we ended up back together again because, you know, we just met up and it was just this magnetic kind of, it was supposed to be a conversation, but it, you know, she seduced me, Kevin, you know. I oh, yes, with, that, that yes. old chestnut. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, totally against my will, obviously. Yeah. <laughs> 
Cults Col- have used that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, so that you know, it, it was. It's been an interesting journey with the book. It's been, it's been interesting. And she's now, she read it. You know, when the first print uh, copy arrived from the states, because my, you know, my publisher is Sacred Stories, they're American company. Um, and yeah, the, when, you know, as soon as I had a copy in my hand, I, get, uh, I, I went over to see her and I gave her a copy, and everything was very quiet there wasn't a lot said it was like oh yeah that looks nice that looks great and we were supposed to meet up a few days later and the next day I came back from a walk and she was here and I said what are you doing here and she said I had to come she said I read the book she said I was up all night I couldn't put it down and it's beautiful and I love it and you know thank you so that was the end of the you know the the, the, old, the, the its own little saga and story of the actual you know the the, the birthing of the book if you like it, it's labor and coming into the world and having her blessing. In your relationship with your twin flame then, uh-huh. how many arguments were there? <laughs> it was, uh, yeah, it was just left, right and center. And it was this real dance of what, you see, what would happen was that she, her pattern was to withdraw into herself when she was threatened and when she was scared or when she was feeling, you know, something negative or whatever. She would withdraw inside. And I would, had a, I've got a really sort of fine tuned radar to that. So I would notice when she was withdrawing and that would make me feel needy and insecure and controlling and not very terribly attractive. And then that would, you know, so then that would manifest in various ways. And that would cause her to withdraw even more. So my challenge was always, as soon as I felt her withdrawing, to actually be more open and to be more laid back and to be more, you know, trusting and okay. But that dance just kept happening. And it still happens. It, is, <laughs> it still happens a tiny bit when, when we meet. But it's, you know, it's it's just like, you know, it was like 99 out of 100 percent power. And now it's like maybe one or two percent. So the argument and then the leaving and stuff were, you know, and her storming off and, and not coming back, they, they were pretty regular. And and there was a time when, when that happened right in the early days, which just somehow just totally triggered my, my childhood wound. I, I kind of went back and was regressed to almost like a seven month old baby and was just in trauma and, and in so much pain and stuff. When actually on the surface, you know, we'd had an argument and my girlfriend had said, I need to cook for some time to, to think about this. But my the little boy in me was just, yeah, I, I was just totally distraught. I couldn't eat. I couldn't sleep. I was just in so much emotional pain that was vastly, you know, uh, out of proportion right, with the right. argument that we had. You know? did, did that affect your work? It did affect my work. Yeah, it did affect my work. It was uh, in that, you know, during those times, all I could do was just tick over and just do the bare minimum, just really do the things that needed to be done. Um, And I mean, I'm lucky in that and quite well practiced, I guess, in meditation and so on that, you know, if I'm with a client or if I'm in a a meeting or something, I, I will be focused and I will be present. In a way, though, it's actually quite a nice distraction and, uh, you know, moving away from the pain and forgetting about the pain for a bit. As soon as everybody's gone and you're on your own, there's this sudden sort of dropping. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean you talk about uh, you, that she left, but uh, did you want to pull away sometimes? Did you say, right, that's it, I'm done? Strangely enough, no, no. And I, and I th- you see, I think that was why it went so deep and kind of like cleared out this really deep stuff that needed to be cleared out that had never really been touched before because I, I made a commitment at the beginning and I was just so in love with her that I, I said, whatever it takes. I, 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 I was under this belief because I think I'd always left every other relationship that I'd had. You know, it was me that ultimately made the decision to leave my marriage and a couple of shorter relationships afterwards. And I believed that if I made the commitment to stay and I committed to it and I did the work, that it was a foregone conclusion that we would live happily ever after. It never really entertained, you know, I never entertained the thought that it would be her 
that was the one that kept leaving. Perhaps that was a bit of arrogance on my my part. I don't know, or naivety. Had you not been in so much in love, would it, would that have been different for you? Do you think? And and also yeah. and also, it would have been right. Yeah, 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 definitely. And 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 it was just a kind of like it was just a timing, you know. It was the timing. It was we came together in sort of quite mysterious circumstances, if you like. The synchronicities were quite uh, powerful, you know. The chances that because we met, and then very briefly, but I was coming to the end of a relationship, so I wasn't available. And then, yeah, we just met for ten minutes for half an hour, and uh, at an author fair, and then I met her again nine months later. In, in this total chance, you know, a real sort of one in a million that, that we happened to be in this, you know, the same place at the same time. So it really felt like we were meant to be together. And I was ready. I, yeah, I'd said, I said, no more. Uh, you know, I'd just come out of another broken relationship not long before. And I knew my wounding. And it was like, I'm not doing this anymore. This is, this stops here. Well, were you in love or did you just love her as a person or were you? In love, and what what it, what is the difference to you nowadays after going through a, a marriage as well, and going through everything you've been? What's the difference between loving, saying to someone, you know, I love you as a person, but am mm. I in love? I think that's a really good question, Kevin. And we could we could have the whole um, the whole show about this, really, because uh, you see, you know, I, I think what we are taught to believe is love. You know, the Hollywood version, romance, the rom- or the romantic song. Well, you know, I think that's just the very tip of the iceberg. And I, I, I think there's an awful lot of untruth. You know, yeah, it's, it's one little slither of, of what connection and intimacy and relationship is about. But I think so much is, you know, is actually missed out. Um, what was your initial question? Well, you know, I suppose it was in a sense, uh, was you in love or yeah. did you did you did you just love her and and actually what is the difference of being in love and and yeah. and and just you know I I love you as a person but I'm not in love in a sense do you know what I mean? Yeah, I, I, I'm still finding that out really. You know, I'm still finding I, you know the, the, it's it's a work in progress and you know it came up for me quite often and you see I think that a lot of what we call love is actually codependency and based on fear. It's like a neediness and it's like, I want you to complete me. And, you know, I was aware of that in the wooing stages with my twin flame when we were kind of courting and getting to know each other. I was very aware that I was doing things, romantic things, because I wanted to show my adoration, my feelings towards her, but also because I wanted to kind of catch her, you know, to, 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 to have her to, so that, you know, that she was mine. So, and there's a, there's a kind of like a fear, there's, you know, infused uh, fear energy infused in that wanting, you know? Yeah. I mean, how long did it die off then when you was with her that, that, that you wasn't so much in, in love, but you, you love certain aspects of it, but that, that obsessive in loveness wasn't there anymore, but it had transformed into some other type of love. Do you know what I mean? That was just as yeah. powerful. Yeah. It, I guess what's happened is that it's transformed form, form from this. It's almost like, yeah, there were two strands of a rope, this real intense in love, but one strand was fear and one strand was love, but we call it, you know, in love. And it's progressed and moved into a place of, it's a bit like the soulmate thing that we alluded to, you know, it's softer and it's stronger and it's just like a we are, there's a, there's a, there's a sense of surety uh, about it and that we're meant to be together and that it's, and there's also, and it's okay if we are not together. Yeah, well, that's hard for some people because there are uh, some people, can, you know, in the twin flame stage. I'm, I'm guessing can be a bit, little bit obsessed where they don't, they can't, they can't think of the one or the other. They, they want you. That's it. Massively, massively, yeah. And you know, and I, it's that thing about you know, if you love somebody, then set them free, because, because you see, I don't believe that the success of a relationship is dependent on staying together. I believe that the success of a relationship is dependent on how deep you travel together. 
and how far you serve each other in realizing the truth of actually who you are. Very profound, but um, what if you trucked, trucked marriage into this twin flame relationship that you had, right? What if uh, she wanted to marry you? What, what, if it, what if that had happened? What would you have done? I'm open. I'm open to that. Um, you know, just for me, marriage is a <clears throat> is is a. I guess it's a it's a declaration of commitment, you know. And, and it's like, yeah, it's a, it, I, I quite like ceremony and so on, you know, to to mark an occasion and that it's something to be to be entered into. I also like uh, in the, you know, in the more sort of Celtic uh, pagan sort of way of doing things that they have a hand fasting every year <clears throat> so you get married but each year you choose whether to renew those vows and I actually really like that you know that, that really sort of resonates for me because it may be that if we're coming at you know marriage and relationship <clears throat> from this perspective then it may be that you've come as far as you can travel together and maybe that it's time for you to go your separate ways and, and that did actually happen w with myself and my twin flame. You know, the, the, the second time that we separated, it was very amicable and, and you know, and we wished each other well. And, and it was just this kind of, you know, perhaps our, it just seems that our roads are, you know, diverging now and we've traveled as far together. And thank you for, you know, for all the lessons and the learning and the beauty and the everything. You know, I, I wish you well. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, I, I, I knew I was going to find this interview fascinating because I mean, I've, you know, even I've typed stuff up on the twin flame and I'm like, eh, do I actually really understand it? And then when, when speaking to you, I can actually say I've had some twin flame relationships most definitely because not, not all of them last as well. You know, mm -hmm. some can, I do believe you can, I do believe you can uh, make it last. I don't, there's there absolutely no reason why not. Uh, but it's like you said, you know, how far do you both want to go and do you recognize what's really going on as well um yeah yeah not easy stuff not easy stuff and that's why you know people like this concept of, of well what they well i think i think people can relate i think that's what i'm trying to say here to the concept of what what you're talking about here as well but also in your book and i know we're getting to the to the end of this interview almost but you talked about the the sacred masculine as well and i thought we just Better touch on that before we uh, before we go. <laughs> uh huh. Uh huh. Um, the sacred masculine. The, it seems to me that yeah, we're you know the a few generations and a few hundred or thousand years or whatever of patriarchy. You know, the place doesn't look like it's in too good a shape. I think there's perhaps room for improvement, and you know, so I would deduce that a lot of that is down to man. You know, as man has made a lot of the decisions and has, you know, been in the positions of power a lot of the time. So the sacred masculine is a new model, a new template, a new uh, possibility of a different kind of man. It seems that we need a different kind of man if humanity is to survive and we're, you know, to create a more beautiful world for our children and the generations to come. So the sacred masculine essentially is somebody that has made significant progress in in the um, in the union of their masculine and feminine energy within themselves the sacred masculine is somebody who recognizes and is um, is, is, is profoundly um, in awe of if you like or uh, reverent towards the divine feminine, you know, all manifestations of the feminine, but whether it be creativity, whether it be mother of nature or whether it be woman herself. Uh, the sacred masculine is somebody who, you, you know, if, if we think of three stages, the, a, a boy is very selfish and it's all about himself and, you know, what he can get and so on. A man is when we progress to become a man, then a man starts thinking about how can I, um, you know, take care of my family, my children, my, my mother or my parents or, or, or my wife. But the sacred masculine is somebody who goes further than that and says, how can I serve the collective 
as well, who recognizes that we are all interconnected, that, uh, that, that actually there are no others, as we do to others, we do to ourselves. If you like, we're all cells, you know, on one body of planet Earth, you know, and it, it's like the cells of a body. If if the cells in the toe decide to, you know, to, to not operate properly and you get cancer or something, that affects the whole body, doesn't it? So the sacred masculine comes from this perspective and recognizes that, you know, we're all interconnected and and, uh, this, and, uh, and that service is key to the way that he lives his life because he knows that when he's in service, he's in the most alignment with the truth of who he really is. You know, it's kind of undoing all that stuff around competition and there's, there's not enough and dog eat dog and all that sort of old paradigm stuff. And I guess that the last thing I would say about the sacred masculine is that somebody who knows that what we perceive with our senses is just the tip of the iceberg of what's actually going on. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much for that. Thank you. And, you know, is there a sacred fem a feminine counterpart to the sort of sacred masculine as well? Yeah. 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 For, for, you see, I can be a bit pernickety about terminology, but, and the words get swapped around. But for me, the sacred masculine is somebody that has, uh, yeah, that, that alchemy, that uh, union of the divine feminine and masculine energies within himself. Now, they're not gender specific. It could be yin and yang or anima and animus. It's just those two, two energies. And the sacred feminine is a woman that has also reached significant union of the divine masculine and feminine energies within her as well. So that she is somebody that is, do, that is doing her work and, and will, will be very much, you know, service, know that the senses are the tip of the iceberg, she's, she's prepared to do her inner work, um, you know, and, and the similar things to the sacred masculine. Right, right. And um, obviously you've got, uh, is it two boys that you've got? I have two sons, yes. Two sons, yeah. yeah. Have, um, obviously they know of some of the work that you're doing. I mean, is that something that you've tried to, um, you know, teach them as well? And how, how do people with kids, you know, teach those things as well? That I mean, obviously you're a dad, you know, you've, you've had to experience that. Yeah. Um, there's, it's a little bit of a tender point um, in that I would like, my sons are, are still both of the sort of age where they're a bit like, Dad, you you know you're into it's a bit weird what you're into and that like you know, you have to have long hair you know can can't you tie it back? I remember my my son who's he's 19 now but I remember him saying something like oh, Dad you have to help people it was like it was like it's really uncool you know can't you just have a, a normal job and be you know raping the planet or you know just going to work at, you know so it's uh, there's a little bit of you know I I think the to answer both parts of that question, the, the greatest way that we can teach is through modeling. And, you know, and children learn, you know, by what we what we do, not not what we say. And, you know, and I, I haven't lived with my sons. They've come to stay with me regularly. But, you know, they're, they're with their mother for they were with their mother for the, most of the last 10 years. So they haven't been able to absorb as much as I would like. Um, and at the moment, they're both of a, an age where they're kind of it's a, it's a bit a bit like the prodigal son, you know. They need to go away and go and find their own way in the world and do their of own course. thing. Of course, of yeah. course. Yeah, you can't and, you can't shape. I mean, that's their destiny, isn't it? As well, and yeah. uh, I, I and I suppose as well, you know. I mean, pff, look at us. Do you know how long did it take us to get it? Do you know what I mean? <laughs> it was a journey, wasn't it, for us absolutely. both? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. There's no there's no pressure on them. You know, I see that they're they're their own individuals and they may never come into alignment with the things that are important to me but I'd, I'd also like to think that they will you know when the, when the time is right but it may be when they have children or you know when things settle down a little bit for them but it's I'll, I'll love them to bits whatever they choose well thank thank you uh, Miguel for uh, answering that as well what would you say then obviously let's wrap this up um, what would you say is the most important message of your work Mm. Um, I guess the most important message is 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 to take responsibility. Is to take is to uh, just come from the place and accept that we're all we're all flawed. That's what it is to be human, and that um, you know, in when we're in relationship with another, 
we have the potential to heal ourselves. It's, it's never about what the other is doing. It's always a reflection and a gift and a way for us to look inside ourselves. I would say that's probably, you know, because if everybody does that, if everybody takes responsibility for their own wounds, then the world gets transformed, doesn't it? Rather than people looking outside and going, you know, you need fixing and you need this and you need that. Just just look look, look within. Look within and, to, and do your best to accept yourself as you are and at the same time endeavour to be the best version of yourself possible every day. Thank you, thank you. And your website is? Yes, yeah, just migueldean.net. Excellent. Okay, well, we've been putting that um, website up throughout this interview as well, just on the lower third. Uh, your book's available from all good bookstores. I know it's on Amazon as well. Uh, we'll put a link in the description for your book and for the um, website. And I just want to say, Miguel, I've really enjoyed this interview, so thank you very much. I've really enjoyed it as well. Yeah, thank you, Kevin. Thanks ever so much for the invitation. Yeah, I wish you, wish you all the best. Yeah, take care.